Hi, we're out here on the range today, so as usual, bear with me if you hear gunfire in the background. As you've probably already guessed, we're talking about shotguns. Shotguns come in every shape and size you can imagine, and a few shapes and sizes you probably can't. Shotgun ammo comes in every size, shape, configuration, color, and flavor you could ever think of, and a few you probably didn't think of. If we wanted to do an in-depth expose on shotguns and shotgun ammo, we would be here for days. But we're going to try to condense that into a few minutes, not a few days. So this is just a brief overview. It's just an introduction to shotguns. Hence the title, Introduction to Shotguns. So let me show you a couple of the basic types. This is a break action shotgun. Push the lever to the side and it breaks open and you put a shell in. Got this from my friend Stan, hence the Stan gun. Another type of break action shotgun is a double barrel breaks open, put two rounds in instead of one. This one has exposed hammers, a lot of them don't. You'll find shotguns in just about every action there is. You can even find bolt action shotguns, but they're not all that common. I'm just dealing with the common types. Pump shotguns, old ones, up to new ones like this Mossberg. Technically called slide action, but usually called a pump because you pump them. Auto loaders, from old ones like this Remington Model 11. You'll see some that look just like that, but they're a Browning. This one's a Remington. Up to modern high dollar ones like this Weatherby. Shotgun ammunition comes in, again, a myriad of different configurations. But today I want to talk about just the three most common. Buckshot, birdshot, and slugs. And before I go into explaining all of that, let's shoot a couple of those and so you can see what they do. So to show you what the three different rounds look like when they hit, we have three shoot and see targets. So we'll shoot left to right, birdshot, buckshot, slugs, and you can see the effect they have. Okay, we'll start with our Mossberg 500 and our three different types of shells. Well, this is our birdshot, and you can see that's lots of little pellets. By contrast, our buckshot is just a few big pellets. And by even greater contrast, our slug is one big bullet. Now, let me show you a close-up of what those different projectiles look like. Well, here's our three different types of projectiles. Birdshot, which as you can see is a lot of little pellets. Buckshot, which is a few big ones, and a slug. Now, birdshot, its use is in its title, birdshot. It's made to shoot birds in flight or other small animals like rabbits or squirrels. And with lots of little pellets, you increase your hit probability on something that's small and running fast or flying. And these little pellets, when you shoot them up in the air at a bird, when they fall back down with gravity, aren't going to kill anybody. Buckshot, by contrast, is a few big pellets, and it's made to shoot large game, like deer. That's why it's called buckshot. Now, you see this sandy, salty-looking stuff? That's just an inert silica. And in a lot of buckshot shells, that's packed in there to buffer those pellets, protect them from each other so they don't deform as they go down the barrel. And then the slug. Now, there's different types of slugs, but this is the most common one, and it's called a rifled slug. You see what looks like rifling on it? That wasn't made by it going down the barrel. It comes looking like that. The shotgun barrel is smoothbore, although there are some rifled shotgun barrels. Without any rifling to, to gyroscopically stabilize it, the concept is that if they put those rifling marks there, that'll put a little spin on it. It's debatable whether or not it does. Mainly what stabilizes this is the shape aerodynamically stabilizes it. Well, like when you shoot a pellet out of a pellet gun, the reason they're shaped so weird is to aerodynamically stabilize it. And that's what you do with this. And shotgun slugs can be more accurate than a lot of people think they are. There are lots of different configurations of each of these, but this is the basic gist of it. Now, we've seen what they look like when they hit shoot and see targets. Let's see what kind of effect they have when they hit other stuff. Okay, you saw what they looked like on the shoot and see. Now let's shoot those three different types of ammo at our favorite target, soda jugs. And yes, I use earplugs on every shot I take.
Well, the birdshot put lots of little holes in there. Pretty well blew the jug up. And in fact, there's about 20 pellets still in there. The slug put one big hole in there. But you can see at 15 yards on soda jugs, the effect you got with both was pretty good. Now let's shoot cinder blocks from about 20 yards away and see what kind of effect we get. So how'd we do? Well, here's the birdshot. It's got a lot of little pock marks on there, but it didn't do a lot of damage. Birdshot is good for shooting birds, not heavy stuff like cinder blocks. And you got all these little pock marks. Look like it had a case of the chicken pox or something. Chicken pox, birdshot. The buckshot, there were nine pellets of buckshot in these shells, but we only hit it with three. At 20 yards, even though that's a fairly short distance, that pattern spreads out, and the entropy of the pattern leads you to only three hits. Now, the three hits we had were fairly effective, but there was only three. And the slug, well, there you go. People ask, what's the purpose of a slug? Well, one is to do this, and the other, because it stays together, it's one solid projectile, it doesn't have the pattern entropy that the birdshot or the buckshot does, and it will turn your shotgun into a reasonable long-range rifle. I'm not talking about a 500-meter rifle, but at 100 meters, you can hit things with a shotgun with a slug, and it just gives you more versatility in the, in the firearm. Well, you've seen the three basic types of shot shells and seen a little bit of what they can do. Now, here's the boring part where I have to explain all the numbers on the box. We'll get back to the fun part shooting in a couple of minutes, and I'll try to keep this short. On the box of shot shells, whether it's birdshot, buckshot, slugs, whatever, there's a whole bunch of numbers on there. And this is good information that you need to know when you buy shotgun ammunition. And it's kind of complex, and, and warning, requires a little bit of math, but we'll try to muddle through this and not take too long. So let me explain a basic shotgun ammo box. There's all this information here, and it starts with the size of the shot shell, what gauge it is, in this case, 12 gauge. 12 gauge is by far the most common. There's probably more 12 gauges than there are everything else put together. But there are other, other sizes out there. 12 gauge. Well, to start with, what is a gauge, and how do you know you have 12 of them? What does that even mean? What it means is the way the size of the shotgun bore is measured is in gauge. And what that is is if you had a pound of lead and you divided that pound of lead into spheres of equal size and you had 12 of them, they would be a certain size. In fact, this size. That is 12 gauge, which is about 72 caliber. And it's the same size as your 12 gauge shell. This is a 20 gauge. If you had a pound of lead and you divided it into 20 spheres of equal size, obviously they'd be a little smaller. They'd be about 62 caliber, the size of a 20 gauge shell. And that is what gauge means. And that's why the bigger the number, the smaller the bore. Which immediately begs the question, well, wait a minute, what does 410 mean? Well, 410 is complex enough by itself, that's a topic for another time. But the very short version is, it's not measured in gauge. Even though this box of 410 ammo says right here, 0.1 or 0 .410 gauge, no. This box says 410 bore, and it's measured in bore. That's a caliber, not a gauge. If you measured 410 in gauge, it'd be something like, I think it's 67 gauge. Which then brings the question, well, if it's 41 caliber, why is it interchangeable with 45 Colt? That's why it's a topic for another time. So leave that one out. We'll come back to that on another day. Let's go on the thing here. Length, 2 and 3 quarter. That's 2 and 3 quarter inches. Now, if you measure a 12 gauge shell, you might very well notice that it's not 2 and 3 quarter inches long. It's shorter than that. That's because that length is a measurement of the shell once it's empty. Once that crimped end has been fired and flared out, then it's two and three quarter inches long. In the box, in its unfired condition, it's not that long. And there are, of course, also three inch and three and a half inch shells in some gauges. Now, the next part, this is DR period, EQ period. That is an abbreviation for DRAM equivalence. Now, this is a complicated one. 
In the English system of measurement, when you measure weight in very small weights, you use grains. It takes 437 grains to make an ounce. A dram, that's with a D, not, not a gram, a dram, like dirty dog dram, is 20 grains. And this is a measurement of how much powder is in the shell. So three and three quarter drams would be 75 grains. There is not 75 grains of propellant in here. This is dram equivalence. That means what is in here is what the manufacturer considers to be equivalent to three and three quarter drams or 75 grains of black powder. Well, 75 grains of black powder in a shot shell is a fairly good load. But that isn't what's in there. It's a dram equivalent. And basically that tells you how much powder or, or how much power you have in there. And here's a box of 20 gauge ammo and you'll see it has two and a half drams, not three and three quarter. And here's a box of some, some low base uh, 12 gauge ammo that you're just supposed to shoot skeet with and it has three dram equivalents, not three and three quarter. Next is how much shot you have. Now this typical 12 gauge ammunition has one and a quarter ounce of shot. Some other like, uh, like here's a game load that has one ounce of shot. It's very important that you remember that your shot is measured in weight. You have an ounce and a quarter. And that comes back a minute later. The next thing you have is your shot size. And it'll say a big number six, or over here it's seven and a half. This one even has number nine shot. That tells you how big in diameter the pellets are. And just like gauge, the bigger the number, the smaller the projectile. Now the way you measure that, a good rule of thumb is, you have a basis. Your basis is your BB, a 177 BB. Now BB does not mean a copper ball that you shoot in your Red Ryder BB gun. BB is a measurement of size and it's 177 caliber or just 17. And so this is number six shot. What that basically means is you subtract six from 17 and you get 11. Each one of these projectiles is 11 caliber. This is number nine shot. That means each one of your projectiles is eight caliber. That's some small shot. And over here you got seven and a half and we got some with number four shot. And you can even buy number two shot, which is 15 caliber, and that's pretty big for bird shot. The thing is, how much shot you have, as I said, is measured in weight. Therefore, if you have an ounce and a quarter of number six shot, you have a lower pellet count than if you had an ounce and a quarter of number nine shot. It's still the same weight, but you'd have a lot higher pellets. What you get from that is, as you shoot at long distance and that shot spreads out, if you have a whole lot more pellets in there, you have a denser pattern and a better chance of hitting something small like a quail or a squirrel. But on the downside of that, your pellets are really small and they don't carry the inertia like a bigger, heavier pellet will and they won't hit as hard or penetrate as much when you're trying to shoot something fairly heavy duty like a duck, a goose, or a jackrabbit. And I'll shoot some things in a couple of minutes that I hope will demonstrate that point. But that's the very short version of what all those numbers mean. Now let me show you some buckshot rounds. Buckshot, you can get in boxes of 25, but it usually comes in boxes of five. They presume you're not going to shoot that many deer. Same information, 12 gauge, two and three quarter inch, and it'll tell you the size of buckshot pellet. In this case, double zero or double aught buckshot. Just like birdshot, the smaller the number, the bigger the projectile. Here's a box of number four buckshot, which each one of these projectiles is about 22 caliber. But instead of having a weight of charge, it'll tell you how many pellets are in there. And this is an important number to look at. This is a two and three quarter inch 12 gauge shell, but it has 12 pellets of double lot buck. That might not sound like a lot, but 12 is a lot more than the nine pellet that we've been using so far today. And that's the kind of thing you gotta keep in mind. This right here is number four buckshot, and it has 27 pellets, okay. This Federal ammunition is the same two and three quarter inch shell, but it's two and three quarter inch magnum, so instead of 27 pellets of number four, it's 34 pellets of number four. And that's a lot heavier duty round. So that is the very short, quick, easy version of what the hell all those numbers mean. And yeah, I know that was boring. So now let's get back to something like shooting that's a little more fun. 
Now I said I was going to demo the different effect you get from different sizes of birdshot. Well at 50 yards I've got two shoot and see zombie rat targets and I've got two shells in this shotgun. It's identical ammunition except one has number seven and a half shot and one has number four shot. So let's see the difference in effect we get on these two targets. So how'd we do? Well with our seven and a half shot, we have seven impacts. With our number four shot, we only have one. Now remember, bird shot is measured in weight. So the number seven and a half pellets being a lot smaller give you a lot higher pellet count in the same weight. So at 50 yards, this has enough pellets on there to be an effective hit, and the number four does not. So that seems like the smaller pellets are the way to go. However, just like everything else, there's a trade-off. Smaller pellets are small. They do not carry the inertia that the bigger, heavier pellets will. So if you're trying to shoot at a distance or shooting something with thicker feathers like a pheasant as opposed to a quail or a thicker hide like a jackrabbit as opposed to a mole or something or perhaps shooting something that's hide is covered with something, the bigger pellets will give you the penetration you need, but as you see here, they don't give you the pattern density that you need. So how can you correct that problem? Well, there's probably a lot of ways. Let me show you two of them. So how can you use the bigger shot like number four, shoot long distances like 50 yards, and still retain a good pattern? Well, there's a couple of ways. First of all, use more shot. Before I was using two and three quarter inch shells with one and one quarter ounce of shot. Now I'm using a three inch magnum shell with one and three quarter ounces of number four shot. Let's see if this makes any difference. The first thing you may have noticed is that was a lot more recoil. This kind of ammunition is also a lot more expensive and not all shotguns can shoot three inch magnums. So it's not always an option. But let's go down range and see how we did. So how'd we do? Well, one impact became nine. Now that does not mean that that magnum shell has nine times more shot. It actually has about 40% more shot. But generally speaking, more pellets in the shell mean more impacts on the target. As I said, three inch magnum, not all guns will shoot that and they can be really expensive and the recoil is just prohibitive for a lot of people. So let me show you another method that you can improve your long range impacts. So in getting a better pattern at long distance, we saw that just adding more shot is one way to do it. Another way is using a shotgun that has what we call a choked barrel. Now what does that mean? In some shotguns, the last little bit of barrel is actually tapered down. It's choked down, hence choke. And as the shot column goes down barrel, it's squeezed down just a little bit so it's actually smaller as it comes out the muzzle therefore starting out smaller it retains a smaller pattern at long distance and different guns have different levels of choke all the way from cylinder bore meaning no tapering at all to extra full which is quite a bit but even though I say it's quite a bit it's still such a minute amount it's very difficult to see just by looking at the gun what degree it's choked to so let me show you something how you can tell how much choke your shotgun barrel has just take a dime. Now this comes with a couple of caveats. One, it only works on a 12 gauge shotgun and I'm not aware of any coin that's analogous with other gauges. And two, it requires that you put the, sh the dime in the muzzle, so be safe. So far we've been using this Mossberg 500 which has what's called an improved cylinder. Almost no choke at all. And you'll see that the dime not only fits down the barrel, but has a little bit of, of wiggle room when it does. If you put it down the barrel of this double barrel, now one barrel here is improved cylinder and the other barrel is modified or half choke. In the cylinder barrel, you'll see it fits with some wiggle room. And in the modified, it fits but not much wiggle room at all. And if you try to put it down the barrel of a full choke gun like this Remington Model 11, it doesn't fit at all. And that's how you can tell what degree your shotgun is choked to. Right now, some of you are saying, gee, why don't you just read the barrel? Well, that's a good point. This Remington Model 11, which is full choke, is stamped full right on it. But guns are not always what they're marked, especially older guns and especially shotguns. This Remington Model 11 is also stamped full, but it's not. It's a cylinder bore. 
because somewhere in the 75 years or so since this gun was made, somebody cut the barrel off. Remember, the choke is only in the last little bit. So this is now a cylinder bore. Things are not always as they're marked. Let me give you an example. Some friends of mine and I, we went to the club one night, met a lady who had a tattoo that declared she was property of Jimmy, till a colleague of mine took her home and proved absolutely she was not Jimmy's property. Yes, you did, Brad. Yes, you did. So things are not always as they're marked. The other thing of choke is, when you have choke in your barrel, if it's too much and you shoot at short range in a really tight pattern, it can actually work against you. As you're trying to shoot birds in flight or something like that at very close ranges with a really tight pattern, the whole purpose of a shotgun pattern is to increase your hit probability and it can work against you. So although it helps you at long range, it can hurt you at short range and I'm telling you, it seems like no matter what you do, you always have the wrong choke for whatever the task at hand is. This is the point behind a double barrel. Now, in the Davy Crockett days, the purpose of a double barrel was to have two shots instead of one. Well, that's obviously obsolete in the world of pumps and autoloaders. Today, the purpose of a double barrel is with two barrels, you can have two different chokes, and you can make an instantaneous selection as to which one you need, and that can help a lot. And you thought they just look cool. No, they really have a purpose. But the modern way of adjusting your choke is so on something like this Weatherby Auto Loader, it actually has an adjustable choke in the barrel. You take this key and you will take a piece out of the barrel and you unscrew it. Now this obviously doesn't give you the instantaneous choice you have with the double, but it allows you to, at home ahead of time, figure out what you're going to need. You take the piece out and you just put in a different one and that changes the choke in the barrel. And it comes with three of these for improved cylinder, modified, and full choke. And you just screw it in with your key. And it doesn't have to be super tight, just snug, and you're good. And that's the modern way of doing choke. So rather than using heavy duty magnum loads, we'll go back with the same ounce and a quarter and number four shot, shoot the shoot and see at 50 yards and we'll use a full choke barrel and see how that affects our pattern. So now we're back to our 12 gauge 2 and 3 quarter inch shell with 1 and 1 quarter ounce of number 4 shot and a full choke barrel. Let's see how this affects our pattern. So how'd we do? Well, with the cylinder bore barrel and an ounce and 3 quarter of shot out of the 3 inch magnum, we had 9 hits. Now we're back to an ounce and one quarter of shot, and we got 20 hits just by virtue of using a full choke barrel. So a full choke barrel is the way to go when you're trying to shoot 40, 50, 60 meters. However, like I said before, at really close ranges, this can work against you in comparison to the cylinder bore. Let me show you what I mean. Now let me show you what I mean by sometimes a full choke barrel can work against you. I've got these two shoot and see targets, and we're going to shoot these from 15 yards and see the difference between a cylinder bore and a full choke barrel. So how'd we do? You can see with the cylinder bore the shots is spread out a lot. In fact, this went into a very big pattern. It's still, if pellets are close enough together that you're going to hit whatever bird is flying by or whatever it is you're trying to hit. But this will give you good hit probability. By contrast, your full choke is so tight, every one of those pellets is on this piece of paper. And that can actually work against you if you're trying to hit something small or fast or flying at very close distances. So you can see the great difference between full choke and improved cylinder bore. And you can see that there's, just like everything else, there's always a trade-off. What is a great thing to have in some situations is not so good like when you shoot at long distance. Primarily shotguns are made to be used at fairly short ranges, but you can shoot them at longer ranges with the right gun and the right kind of projectile. When you start shooting at truly long ranges like 100 yards is when you really want to use a slug if at all possible. 
So I've got a target set up there at 100 yards, and I've got five slugs loaded in here. And you recall we showed you in the beginning a slug is just one big bullet. So let's shoot this how we do. Well, there's our group. Now you got to remember that I'm shooting offhand at 100 yards with a smooth bore gun with no sights on it. So considering those things, that's not a bad group. The main point here is that the shotgun, when loaded correctly, can hold good groups at 100 yards and even beyond. So you can use it at long ranges. A big key is that you have to know where it hits because you can't adjust any sights when you don't have any, just a bead. And so you've got to shoot enough slugs at this distance to know where your gun hits. So there you have it, a very brief, although not as brief as I hoped it to be, introduction to shotguns. We covered the three basic types of ammo, birdshot, buckshot, slugs, and remember there's lots of different types, but those are the most common, and your most common types of shotguns. Brake actions, a couple of different auto loaders, and your pump action. We talked about some of the terminology like shot column and choke and pattern and a couple of those other things. So hopefully you learned something out of this. Hopefully that gives you a fairly good understanding of how shotguns work. And it comes with a disclaimer of if we really wanted to go in depth, we could be here for days. So as always, don't try this at home, I'm what you call a professional, and thanks for watching the Intro to Shotguns video.